Okay, we're going to get started here with kind of a pickup from where we were last week, last time, and then we're going to, I'm hoping <laughs> this morning, these three lessons to get all the way through the King James translators, okay? Um, and uh, I know folks on the internet, you see papers and stuff, and that's just some internal handouts. I don't have any of this online, so... Um, you're, you, we'll talk about what in, is on each one, but uh, if you email me or something, I can try and get them to you. Um, we have been looking at trying to figure out how to get this thing started. <laughs> uh, we, were, we started by looking at the satanic attack. Do you remember the five-prong attack that we started there in Genesis 3? 16 lessons ago, do you remember? <laughs> Something to do with the wife. Okay, well first he questions the word, then he adds, he subtracts, right? Okay, add, subtracts, waters it down, and then denies, all right? Then we went and we talked about revelation, works to inspiration. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry, get Romans 16 and verse 25 and 26. Was where we, I'm sorry, I should have told you that. Um, then we talked, we talked about preservation, and that works to the issue of illumination. And then I introduced you a fifth term, and that is the issue of translation, okay? Now, revelation, that's God to man, and then man to paper, okay? And that's the words, and we looked at the, these doctrines specifically, okay? Preservation, do you remember we had the promise of preservation? Then we had the process, which is the issue of copies. And then we had the people, if you remember. Okay? Uh, Israel, the nation of Israel, the tribe of Le Levites, it, specifically, but there were also other men, other people like uh, Hezekiah's men and stuff like that that were involved in it as well. Then today, in the church, the church, the body of Christ. And last week, or last week, last time, we were talking about the people of the Scripture. And we were talking about um, the, the fact of illumination, where you take, this is the preservation is done through the, the multiplicity of copies, but then you take the word... And it gets into the heart of people. And when I did that, we, we ran up all the different uh, Bibles that lead to the King James Bible in the history. Okay? And th that's on one of those handouts. We did it last time. Okay? Now, today, we're going to talk about translation. And we're going to run the work, we're going to run these back up again, and but we're going to look specifically at the things that lead to the King James Bible. Okay, so you have just real quick, you have a history of the English Bible. You'll see the ancient scrolls and the ancient text, the ancient copies. Um, Ninety-five percent of them are going to match up and and equal up into what becomes the King James Bible, okay? 5% of them end up in the modern day translation, all right? Uh, you'll see the middle row there with the Dewey Rames and the Wy Wycliffe and the Vulgate. Obviously, the Vulgate was there first, and then Wycliffe, and then the Dewey Rames. Those come off the ancient. Uh, the Dewey Rames is the Catholic Bible, but when you study the Catholic Bible, you quickly begin to understand and realize that it also doesn't really, it, it strays from the Greek and the Hebrew of the King James, but not very far, 
It's very interesting. Some of the verses that we would think they don't, uh, that they would mess with, they don't mess with. <laughs> so it's, it's a very interesting thing. All of the modern day translations come off of the Greek text of Westcott and Hort. And we'll talk a little bit about those guys. My goal isn't really to concentrate on the critical stuff. My goal is to concentrate on the King James, okay? Um, if you want the critical stuff, I would encourage you to take Gray School of the Bible, Manuscript Evidence, year one. And by the time you're done with it, you're like, ugh. And then you're, you know, the whole semester 103s or 102 is on about the critical text almost literally the whole thing <laughs> so you get a good dose of it or you can just get into it and study it yourself and that's okay but you really I'll be honest with you I don't want to say it's a waste of time but it's time consuming very good that's a polite way to say that okay all right so when we come today I want to talk about translation uh, look real quick here at, at Romans 16 verse 25 and 26 and we're going to do this and then next month in August we'll spend a little bit more time on translation I just want you to get the, the thought here uh, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to who all nations for the obedience of faith. So if this information that was given to, to Paul by the, the Lord Jesus Christ, it is given to who? To all nations. So that means who? Everybody, every language, every people group is supposed to be named. So I, I gave you a, a, there's another little handout, World Events and Related to the Printed Bible. You can go down through that. I'll make some key point. I'll outline some points on that for you as we go through, okay? The other handout was the Bancroft's Rules. That'll be the last study we look at if we get there this morning, okay? <laughs> All right? So when you think about, we're going to start at the top, and we're going to just kind of work our way down, okay? And I'm, um, we're thinking about translations. By the way, you have no problem with the translation. Your King James Bible is a translation. That's what it is. Okay? You understand that. Uh, in Exodus, God tells Pharaoh, uh, tells Moses to go talk to Pharaoh. What language did God talk to Moses in? Hebrew tongue. Okay? He's a Hebrew. But what language did Pharaoh speak? Egyptian, at least. So Moses spoke two languages right there. So God tells Moses, you go tell Pharaoh. So God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So he comes over in the Hebrew tongue and says what? Let my people go. Moses takes it over, translates it over into Egyptian and says to Pharaoh what? Let my people go. Then you and I get it translated into English of what? Let my people go. Not a, nothing's missed in any of that. Okay. Now, I would imagine that the Egyptian language, I, I don't speak Egyptian, was not as simple as let my people go. It might have been a, you know, a whole big long thing. If you've ever been around Spanish-speaking pe people, it, it, you, you can ask a question, and they'll talk to you for five minutes, and it's really just a couple-word answer, you know, when you translate it back. So, but the, the message isn't missed. Nothing's missed in it. So we'll talk some more about translations next time. But, but I just want to get this history into you and then talk about the Greek text and talk about things along that line. So... You have the, to come out of, and I'm looking at this history page, okay, just so you know where we're at. If you look at the very bottom of the, the page, you'll see a guy, a guy by the name of Wycliffe, okay? You see Wycliffe there? 
he's, he's the first guy. Wycliffe, uh, he, he published, uh, he's the first one in 1382-ish to, to put uh, a Bible of some sort into English, and he did it longhand, no printer. He just sat and wrote it out. Wycliffe is the number one guy. Then if you'll run your eyes up a little bit to 1437, uh, that's Gutenberg's printing press is invented. Uh, you, uh, then, I'm sorry, 1456. Then you've got, you see how in 58, 1458, 1476, 1488, 1491, all that stuff in there about Greek is beginning to be taught. I'm in this one right here. I'm, I'm down here at the bottom. Greek is beginning to be taught in the universities. It's beginning to be learned. The first Greek grammar is published. The first printed Hebrew Bible is published. Then Greek is taught at Oxford. See those guys? Now let your eye roll up and you'll see another man by the name of Erasmus. And Erasmus is our man. And Erasmus, he's the guy that first published the Greek New Testament. What Erasmus did, we're going to read some stuff about him, is he had access to all of the known libraries of the day. You know how today the Vatican, you can't go in there and can't look at everything? He had access to all that, way before the Vatican ever showed up or it was even a thought. So did your King James translators, by the way, okay? Your King James translators had access to the text that, that sits underneath the Dewey Rames. And you know what they did with it? They rejected it. They put it aside. Okay? So you, you have Erasmus. At the same time as, as Erasmus, you've got Martin Luther. Okay? And then you got Win, uh, William Tyndall, or Tyndale. And those guys all work together. Tyndall goes and he spends time with Erasmus, learns, understands. Now, the thing is about Erasmus is he's produced a Greek New Testament, all right? Luther takes that information and puts it into the German language. Now we have our German Bible, the New Testament, okay? Then Tyndall comes down. And he takes the Greek, and now we have uh, Tyndall makes a New Testament. You with me? Then you got Miles Coverdale. Bible shows up. All right. Then you get Math the Matthew Bible shows up. Now, the Matthew Bible is really written by John Rogers. We're going to get into all these guys a little bit more here as we go along. Then you have the Great Bible. You remember where we're at now. <laughs> okay. Now you have, then you have another guy on your list. And his name is Stephanus, or Stephen. I call him Stephen. He can go either way, all right? And what Mr. Stephen does is he produces the Greek text that sits at the very core of your King James Bible. Here is Stephen's Greek New Testament right here, okay? All right? You can look at it, but if you take it, I will hunt you down and kill you. No. <laughs> Okay, I don't have any of the corrupt text. I have just the right text, all right? And guess what it is? <laughs> it's Greek. <laughs> okay, so Stephanus or Stephen, he produces his Greek text, okay? Then you have the Geneva Bible show up. The Geneva Bible is out of Switzerland, okay? The reason it's out of Switzerland now is because Bloody Mary, Queen Mary's on the throne in England and she stopped all Bible publishing and she act, she's a Catholic and she went and went after the Protestants, okay? 
Then you have the Bishop's Bible. All right. And let's see, what's the next one after? The Bishop's Bible will be our King James Bible in our line, but there's some other things that are going on there. It, it, after the Bishop's Bible, you have the Dewey Rames produced prior to the King James Bible. You have the Spanish Bi uh, Bible produced, all right? So you have things going on. Now the Dewey Rames is produced in protest or in counter opposition to the King James Bible being produced. Okay, so kind of get all that back on there. That's from last time. Last time we talked about the people. I wanted you to see the people. Today I want you to see the history behind w what is happening. Okay, now after the King James Bible, I lost my chalk. There it is. Okay, this is 1611. Bishop, let's get this one quicker to use. Bishop's Bible. 1568, the Great Bible, oh, I missed the Great Bible, didn't I? <laughs> All right, the Great Bible is in there. He's 1539. The Geneva Bible is 1560. Well, I messed that up, didn't I? So much for it looking pretty, right? That's okay. It's just us today. Just us. So the Great Bible. Oh no, I had it down there. Duh. Uh, I've only been up since 3 o'clock this morning. So 1539, the Coverdale Bible is 1535. Tyndall is 1525. Luther is 1522. Okay, roughly. Did I miss anybody? All right, so from 1611, when the King James Bible was finished, by the way, the Spanish was 1602. The Dewey Rames, the New Testament was produced in 1582. Okay, just the New Testament. In 1609, the whole new and old were together, okay? Am I bored you yet? Okay, I'm working on it. So from 1611 to 1881, you have the revised version produced in England in 1881. In 1901, you have the American Standard Version produced. Okay. By the way, Stephen is 1551. Erasmus is 1516. Get those up there. You see a great chunk of time, don't you? All right? You're with? Okay. In 1901, you have the American Standard Version. 1913, got a guy by the name of Moffat show up. 1923, you got a Got by the name of Good Speed, show up. 1951, the RSV is a revision of the RV. So they said, hey, we got to make ours update now. Okay. 1963, you have the new American Standard Version, because we got to update that bad boy. 
Then in 1973 and in 1976, you've got a little guy by the name of the NIV. 73 was the New Testament, 76 was the Old Testament. Okay? And then you got another guy that shows up in 1981, and that is the New King James Bible. And we're going to spend a whole lesson on the New King James Bible <laughs> next time. Next, all right? Because from 1611, the King James was the standard. And in 1881, there's a guy by the name of Wes Cotton Hort show up. And I'm going to give you a whole list of guys. And you got another guy by the name of Shriver, Shrivener. He shows up. And what they do is they take that ancient, that 5% of the manuscripts, and they develop a new, a new Greek text. Okay, now I know you probably can't read all that, and folks on the internet, you should have been here, okay? <laughs> but if you walk with me, you don't really need the handouts, you, you've got that up there, okay? Now, you got Romans, right? The, the original text, the originals, and, and again, we've looked at this and just give you some history here. The, the, the originals and all of that were around till about 100 A.D. Now we're talking about New Testament, okay? The Old Testament had been gone a while, <laughs> all right? It gets divided up in, into sections, 500 to 1,000, and then 1,500 to 2,000. And the period between 500 and the 1,500s is what is called the Dark Ages, and history gets divided up that way. It starts in the 500 A.D. The Reformation starts over there. You got all this going on. You got, you got them coming out of the Dark Ages. You've got tremendous amount of things happening and so forth. You're going to hear a term if you don't haven't heard it already. My goodness, Rick, what'd you do? Let's just go like this, okay? Tech. Texas Receptus. Have you heard that one before? Heard that word before? Okay. So you're gonna have you're gonna hear TR. Tech Textus Receptus. That is a Latin term. Okay. It showed up in 1624. And it's Latin. It simply means the received text, okay? Now, your, that received text started way back over there, just wasn't called that, okay? It actually is a term used by a group of guys we're going to talk about in a little bit, the Beza brothers and their Greek texts as they begin to write and stuff. And the Texas Receptus, again, it's a Latin expression that was used in about 1624 A.D., for the Greek text, simply means the received text. The received text simply means what? The text commonly used by the people. I mean, duh. It's not, this is not brain surgery, folks. When we talk about the translators here in a little bit, these guys had deep doctrine of divinities. They, were, they, would, they could speak seven languages. They understood your English language way better than your English teacher ever did, or you. They got it all down. And the thing is, is these guys were in the elite status, and they did this out of love of king, country, God, having the book. They had proper motivation to do what they've been doing. All along, and all of these guys, Went Wycliffe, Tyndall, Erasmus, John Rogers, who is the Matthew Bible, these guys, Miles Coverdale, he's, he, he's an instrumental guy, and a lot of these guys, Miles Smith, he was on the translator committee. All these men that were there, they weren't doing this for a dollar. Okay? The printer, when, it, when the King James Bible is done, 1610, they take it to the printer. It cost the printer 36,000 pounds 
That was two years of his livelihood to print it. He had to pay to print it. They didn't pay him. He had to pay, okay? <laughs> because it was, but you know what he got in his reward? He got the patent to, and the copyright to be the king's printer. So anything else going forward, guess what he did? He made his money back. Don't, <laughs> he wasn't destitute. But see, the thing is, is these guys had a, had a pure motive, and it comes out of the Reformation, all right? And when you get down to uh, this stuff, it, it becomes, an, a, 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 again, a real fascinating and wonderful um, understanding of the history. Now, again, I'm not going to try to bore you with all the little details, but there's some things I don't want to leave out. Uh, w when you get to the 1500s, uh, there's copies are being made of the, Greek, uh, of the received text, the Greek text. But again, not everybody speaks Greek, so like in Syria, there's a version called the Syriac translation in about 150 A.D. Again, we looked last time at the, Pol uh, the Polyseans, and we looked at the Waldensians. They were Latin. And what did they have? Same text, just in Latin. That's why when we looked at the people, I wanted you to see those guys, because they sit there in our history. When you come down, when you get to Wycliffe, uh, Wycliffe, 1382, Wycliffe translates the Latin Vulgate into English, and then he dies in 34. Okay? Um, just trying to see. In 1482, Wycliffe's bones are dug up and burned because he translated the Bible into English. Tyndall, all right, William Tyndall was hated and hounded all over Israel and was finally betrayed into the hands of the papist by a friend, quote unquote, who invited him to go out and have a meal. Why did they hate him so bad? Because tra he translated the Word of God. He's, do he's working on this. So it, the text gets refined, it gets worked down through each one of these guys, each of this. But when we get to Tyndall, the Greek text is pretty set. Erasmus's Greek text is pretty set, Tyndall's translation. And, it, and literally, if, when you think about this, your King James Bible is William Tyndall's Bible, honestly. But what happens is, is at different stages, things are getting refined through and sifted through, okay? And that refining process starts in 1382, and it goes all the way, and it finishes in 1611 with the King James Bible, all right? Um, by the way, the Roman Catholic Church had outlawed, made it... Uh, uh, the uh, copying and the translating of the Bible until they got to time to do their own. Then they had the councils of Dort and, or councils of Trent go, eh, except for, and they did a little curvy cue, got uh, Ignatius Loyola involved, and the Jesuits started, and, you know, the next thing, here you go. Okay? So when we, t what I want to do with you is just kind of, just, we're just going to walk through the history again, but look at the history. Okay, when they, there were, there's like 50, almost 5,300 manuscripts today, all right? They, they found more, you know, they find them. Of the 5,300, 95% of them agree with the received text. 5% roughly don't. Now, those are rough numbers, so don't email me. You, you should have said 52, but I don't care. It's 5,200 and some change. So you have to take into consideration. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, what are they call the Dead Sea Scrolls, they begin to translate. You know, they had a big fight about that, who was going to get to do the translating. And they've come to find out that the stuff that is considered to be Scripture, you know what it matches? The received text. So you, we stuff like that, okay, is there. Uh, the, the biggest invention in the day was the Gutenberg printing press because it took off the handwriting 
and it became now the movable type. In so th that's some interesting, interesting stuff. All right. When these guys got introduced, the landscape changed. Okay. We had a received text. Everybody was using one Bible, one going forward, and then all of a sudden, the, these, the revised versions and all that came up, started going. West Cotton Hort comes along, and uh, they begin to... Uh, actually, West Cotton Hort, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Jehovah's Witness Greek Bible, you know what it is? It's West Cotton Hort. It's what it is when you look at them and you read them. And literally with Westcott and Hort, they are two men who in 1881 convinced the revision committee to forsake the received text and go for, quote unquote, the oldest and the best, which are 4th and 5th century, quote unquote, manuscripts. Subsequently, it has been discovered that quote unquote, the 4th and 5th centuries really weren't 4th and 5th century. They're actually a lot newer. They're actually in the late 1500s, 16, okay? So you, you hear a lot of tales, and sometimes you got to hold on. The Internet's been a wonderful thing <laughs> where they begin to find stuff, okay? What I want you to do with you here, you got your Bibles. The issue between the received text or majority text, okay? By the way, majority, why? Why would it be majority? 95%, right? These guys are called the minority. Why? 5%, okay? I want you to, I just want to run a few verses with you, verses you're very familiar with, okay? Out of the list, who's the big bad boy? Come over to Matthew chapter 1. The big bad boy, the big three, the New American Standard Version, the NIV, and the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, are the big ones. But today it's really the NIV. What I want you to see here for the next few minutes, just looking at verses, Matthew 1, verse 25, is... That the differences between the minority and the majority is a, a majority of the time, it is a difference in the Greek text that they're using. Am I going slow enough for you? I'm trying to. <laughs> okay. Matthew 1, verse 25, in the New American Standard. But kept her a virgin, until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Do you see a difference there? Do you see something missing? Firstborn is missing, right? You're, you're, the King James has something about a firstborn son, right? Now, that passage is leaving, it left out a word, actually a very key word, okay? in doctrinal circles, but the reason it left it out was not really a translating problem, it was a textual problem. They're using a different Greek text. By the way, just so you know, the NIV, guess what it says, and he had no union uh, with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave to him the name Jesus. Again, it's a Greek text issue. Come over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, verse 13. Matthew 6, verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Period. Footnote A. Or from evil, some late manuscripts one, then there's another footnote indicator, 
For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. They, uh, Matthew 6.13, I'm sorry. Have you ever wondered why Catholics never finish the Our Father prayer? It's not in their Bible. They're in, it's a different Greek text. They stop after, and forgive us, uh, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. They stop. The New American Standard has it in brackets. By the way, a footnote in brackets means that if you want to add it, you add it. It's not in the Greek text, but we know that people say this and have it, the familiar. So who le- who's now in a final authority? I am. Because I don't like for thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power to come. Amen. I don't like that, so I'm going to leave it out. See, Now, in the Catholic Bible, I know because I didn't bring my Catholic Bible out here, but um, the uh, Dewey Rame, it it's not even footnoted. It's not even there. Okay, the NIV guys, they, they're catching on. Look over at Matthew 17. Matthew 17. My folks, the issue here is it's different text, different Greek text, and that's really why I put, I, I made sure we know about Erasmus, St- the, Stephen, that we're going to look at the Beza brothers, we're going to look at some different guys here in a minute, because the Greek text, when the translators sat in 1604 and they begin to work, Bancroft's rules will lay some things out for them, but they were looking at the Greek text as well. They weren't just bouncing. There's an idea that because the Bishop's Bible and the Geneva Bible were the two big ones that they just used that. They didn't consult anything else, no. They consulted the Greek text as well. And you see that when you run a parallel up of all these Bibles and, you know, you use different verse, use a verse or something, it's like, oh my goodness, look at the differences just in these verses, in these Bibles. And the King James comes in and solidifies all that. Matthew 17, verse 21 You got it? Okay. Matthew 23, verse 14. Did you? 1721. The NIV has no 1721. Actually, the numbering of the verses go 1720, 1722. They completely leave out 21. They have a footnote about it. The New American Standard has it in, but it's in brackets with the footnote of early manuscripts do not contain this verse. Okay? Chapter 23 of Matthew and verse 14. 23, 14. uh, It's gone. The whole verse. Just so you, by the way, just so you know, the New King James also throws a uh, little footnote on it that says 21 is left out of the oldest manuscripts. That's the New King James. Uh, Matthew 23, 14, gone. Matthew 27, Matthew 27, verse 35. Matthew 27, 35. Matthew 27, 35, gone. Okay. Now, in the NIV, they've put it back in. But guess what they did with it? Footnote. Oldest manuscripts don't have the verse in it. Now, read, read Matthew 27, 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. By the way, the New American Standard Version, they've stuck it back in, but with a footnote. The New King James, just to say, give you a point of that, they've got it in it, but they got a footnote on it that it's left out. 
So is it in or is it out? Which one is it? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Okay. They just completely, the reason it's not in these, these Bibles is it's not in the Greek text. Okay? That they were, it's not in Westcott and Hort. But when in the revision committees, by the way, how many times has that NIV been revised? Oh. On every year, mm -hmm. literally. Almost every year they produce a new one. Mm -hmm. Got to have that money come in. I've got a package, I've told the story in the past, uh, when we've talked about this in church, I got a packet, we were down, when we were on baseline, in the mail at the P.O. box, they were putting out the, um, the, the ESV, was just coming on the scene. Pastor Rick, if you get your congregation to completely move over, we will give you 75% of the proceeds. It's a hundred dollar Bible at the time, okay? Because it's coming out. Out of so, what am I to do? Stand in front of my congregation, get everybody to move over and buy the hundred dollar ESV, and seventy five dollars out of every hundred is going into my pocket. Well, I'd have paid a bill or three off with that. <laughs> but what is it? That's how they do it. They, it's, it's just moving over, okay? Uh, Mark 16, you guys are aware of this one. Mark 16, verse 9 through 20. Um, Mark 16, verse 9 through 20 is gone with a footnote of the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20 in it. And that is across the board. Come over to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And I'm going slow for a reason. The reason it's not Mark 16 in there isn't a translation issue. It's a textual issue. Okay? It's bad. It's, <laughs> it's not there. It's not in their text. Okay, Luke 2 verse 14. Ready? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men, with whom he is pleased. Hmm. Isn't that a little different than yours, your King James Bible? Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace among men, with whom he is pleased. When has he ever been pleased with men? But what do they have? Different Greek text. Um, flip back to Mark 16. I, I should have did this one while we were there. Mark 16 and verse 20. Mark 16. Okay. Mark 16... They make that comment there about the earliest manuscripts and all that stuff. There are 600 copies of Mark 16 in different forms that are from the late. And you know what they all have? 9 through 20 in them. Interesting. Now, look at 620. I, I, look at Mark 16, verse 20. I'm sorry. Mark 6, verse 20. Mark 16, verse 20. Sorry. In the NIV, well, I'm sorry, in the New American Standard. Ready? And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs following. And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus Christ, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and the imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. 
That's the NASV, New American Standard Bible. Of the 600 copies of Mark 16, that added verse isn't in them. doesn't exist. But, guess what? The Greek text, written by Westcott and Hort, Shrivener, uh, Moody Bible Institute, Trinity Div Divinity School there in Chicago, the American Bible Society, Guess what they all have in there? That little extra verse. And the New American Standard, okay? The NIV doesn't have it, but the New American Standard does. They put a note on it, just in case. A few late manuscripts and verses contain this paragraph, usually after verse 8. A few have it at the end of the chapter. <laughs> if wherever. Okay? Look over at... Uh, this one's crazy. Look at Acts 18. Acts chapter 18. Acts 18. Now, I, I, again, just go through these with you, again, not just so that you see the issue is the Greek text, okay? There is some translating issues as well, don't get me wrong, and we'll talk about those when we talk about the translations. But I want you to see the Greek text right now. Look at Acts 18, verse number 7. Acts 18, verse 7. New American Standard, okay? Acts 18, verse 7. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. You, you, what is the King James? It just has Titus, doesn't it? Or Justus, I'm sorry. It doesn't have Titus justice, it just has justice. Okay? If, all right, by the way, the new Schofield Bible, guess what it has in it? Titus justice. Ooh, freaky. Titus, you know, I look at that and go, why in the world would they add Titus to it? So they're subtracting whole verses. They're adding. They're all. They're they're in the satanic attack. That's why you'll hear the NIV called the not inspired version, <laughs> stuff like that. Okay. When you c come through, you're in Acts. Look over at Acts nine. Here's Acts nine. Uh, these, these things just kind of go on and on and on, and I don't want to drone on and on and on. My point is, is that they are different in, their, in the Greek text. Okay? Look at Acts 9. Look at verse 5 and 6. New American Standard. And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuting, are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Do you see something missing? To kick against the pricks? Trembling and astonished and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The New American Standard Version, you don't have any statement in the text that tells you that Paul ever got saved on the road to Damascus. The kicking against the pricks, when you study that out, the pricks, in, in, in chapter 2, the men come to Peter because the Peter's message and word had pricked their heart. Yep. Conviction, you're under conviction. On the road to Damascus, Paul is, he's under conviction. And when he says, Lord, what will you have me to do? Trembling and fearing, and boom, now there's the conversion, Okay. So you have a opportunity here to hide who the Apostle Paul ends up really being. Okay? You go over, you're in Acts, flip back to chapter 4 of Acts. And again, folks, they're different. They're different Bibles. They're, they're, they're different Bible lines, if you will. They're because they come from different Bible texts. Acts 4, 
Look at verse 25. Acts 4, verse 25. You ready? New American Standard. Who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David your servant said... So your Bible doesn't have by the Holy Spirit, does it? So they're adding to it. Okay. By the way, if you look at verse, well, I can get teaching the doctrine. <laughs> okay. The issue is you have different Greek text. And, we're, and the Greek text and the differences begin to come through because there's an attempt to usurp what has become the received Word of God, the received text. Westcott and Hort show up, guys are going to follow him, and they're all going after, really, Erasmus. Now, when we talk about Erasmus in the Greek text, and we talk about these guys, we're, we're, we're just... Again, that's, <laughs> if you can understand that when you, read, when you take your English Bible and you compare it with other English Bibles, that the main difference and the, the, the main issue underneath them is that issue of a different Greek text and a different Hebrew text as well. Okay? They, use, they come in, Jerome and Origen, way, and this is not on the board, it's way off the chart, all right? They're back in the, in the early hundreds. When they come in and they are doing their dead level best to um, origin is in 18, uh, 184 A.D. Jerome is th 362 A.D. These guys are they're producing text that are in error because they're going against what's been handed down. All right? You with me? Am I boring you? You need a break? Are you good? You okay? Take f Let's take five minutes. I'll stop the tape, and then we'll get back in verse number and at 10 o'clock, okay? Let's take five.